morning. Welcome to this morning's worship service. It's a sunny Sunday, and uh, we're going to probably hit zero or even plus one or something. It's, got, it's a good day. Uh, just thank you. <laughs> Jumping into the announcements and to the, into the bulletin. Uh, as was in the bulletin last uh, week, uh, today will be communion. As you can probably see the sacraments on the table here. And uh, so just to let you know ahead of time, uh, we'll have a regular service and then communion will be just right after that. So within the regular service time, we'll have all these things, all these good things going together. Okay, so uh, for those of you who are a part of the life, uh, life culture, uh, Susan Penner will be speaking at uh, Christian Fellowship Church that will be in Winkler. No? That's in Steinbeck. Okay. Uh, it's not part of our church. Okay. I thought it was part of our church. Uh, uh, that's at 6.30 today in Steinbeck. Uh, also, uh, just to let you know too, coming up uh, in February, there's a uh, a message from the board, uh, there's some construction mortgage or loan left to be paid, and so uh, we have a bit of a fun drive for that in February. And uh, so there's uh, some money that uh, we're putting in, in the month of February when you give, make sure you may put a me in the memo, you put uh, a paying down loan. And uh, the current loan balance is 90000 and so uh, we will have a potluck uh, beginning of March to let everybody know how we've done. And uh, it'll be a great time together. So uh, write down on your calendar March 3rd as the potluck day and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, this coming February 4th, which is the next Sunday, we'll have our annual winter fun day here on the yard. We're going to be sharing lunch, supper. A supper, uh, we need a sign-up to sheet to see who's going to come. A supper, we, want, we plan to have uh, some uh, pizza. So if, uh, if you want to sign up for that, it's in the back, in the front. <laughs> um, so just to let you know, uh, we're planning, and we need to know how many people will be here. So we encourage you to sign up. It's going to be a fun day. Like it was last year, we had lots of fun activities, and uh, it's right after the service. So, um, and uh, just to let you know, under the prayer and praise, so um, we have uh, many people. Uh, for those of you who are prayer warriors, just to let you know that Betsy Cameron uh, was told she would, did not require surgery. So keep praying for her. Uh, we pray also for uh, Barney Wheeler's family. She, he lost a sister. So pray for that family. Uh, Marion Heinrichs is still awaiting a surgery date. And so uh, please keep these items in your prayer list on your, uh, during the week. Uh, it also mentions here that pray next week for the sermon prepared by, it says Pastor uh, Rob, uh, but uh, actually it'll be Dave Reimer that'll be here next Sunday. So uh, keep that in mind. Pray for him as he's going to bring the message next Sunday. That's all I have for you right now. So let's bow for a word of prayer before we continue on to the service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. It's a great uh, day to be up. You have awoken us to sunshine, great weather, and uh, the encouragement of other people that have come to church. It's day you have set aside for us to be away from work to rest from all our um, troubles, re rest from all our work the rest of the week, and be like you. Uh, that's what you did at the beginning of creation. You created the whole world. It says in your word that each day that you created this and you created this. And then on the seventh day, you rested. And so we're here to follow that. We're here to worship you. We're here to bless you. Uh, because you are a God who gives many good blessings. Even though uh, we need 
a lot of help. You are the one who helps. And you are quite sympathetic to us. You know our, our plight. And so we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you're willing to be our Father. We look up to you and we ask for uh, help in, in a lot of ways. And so we also ask for uh, hearing. Open our ears. Open our mind to uh, what is going to be uh, ministered this morning. We ask that you give Pastor Rob the words to speak and our, uh, and our ears to be opened so that we can hear, so we can understand, so that we can use it the rest of the week and possibly the rest of the month to bring honor to you. We also want to thank you for the uh, encouragement uh, through our singing. Uh, our voices will be raised, and they will be raised to you. And we ask that you, the, the leaders who will bring song, that you would bless them as well. And that they would uh, uh, give us the, the leading, that we would um, lift our voice and, and, and with love for your kindness to us. And so thank you, Heavenly Father, for providing all these things. And we also ask, Father, that as we're about to give in tithes and in offerings, that you would bless this gift that you would continue to, uh, uh, for us to continue in our, our services to you, to worship you, uh, midweek activities and uh, construction of the, uh, uh, the building and uh, many different phases that we have going. And so uh, bless us, continue to bless us with our incomes, continue to bless us with our giving, and let there be all around praise and encouragement to each other. And uh, so we thank you this morning for what you've done. And be with us uh, in words, and be, be with us in encouragement, and uh, help us to worship together to bring you more honor. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, church. How are we this morning? Good. Enjoying the nice weather. Last week, we introduced to you uh, a two year scripture reading plans. How is that going? Are we keeping up with it so far? I've seen a few nods, that's good. Um, keep at it, it's good to do. Thank you, uh, Sheila and Susie, also for leading us in, in hymns this morning. Those were actually um, very appropriate ones, so thank you. So today we're going to be continuing our series uh, called Spiritual Disciplines for Ordinary People. Throughout this series, we are focusing on the spiritual disciplines, those faith practices that are found in Scripture that tune our hearts to God and open us up for the Holy Spirit to transform us from the inside out. These disciplines are not meant for a special select few. They're not exclusive to those who would be considered spiritual giants or saints. They are for everyone. They are for you and for me. Today we are taking a closer look at the spiritual disciplines of both silence and solitude. If you have a Bible on hand, I would encourage you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings 19, it's the story of the prophet Elijah, who in the midst of an anxious uncertainty meets God in the silent stillness of a cave. 1 Kings 19. And then at the conclusion of the sermon, we will be remembering Christ's sacrifice for us as we eat the bread and drink the cup of communion. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is the day that you have made. May we rejoice and be glad in it. This morning as we come together to worship you, to thank you for what you've done for us, to seek you in your word. We ask, Lord, that you would make yourself known to us. Reveal yourself to us. Teach us. Convict our hearts and shape us into the image of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. For we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you've ever been curious about how many words you might speak in total in a day, you're in luck. In 1998, a group of five researchers began work on a project to determine just how much people talk. Over a span of eight years, they recorded and then studied the everyday conversations of close to 400 participants, both men and women. Now, I know what you're thinking. But contrary to conventional wisdom, women do not speak more than men. At least these are the scientific findings. The average man and the average woman both were found to speak somewhere in the ballpark of, now brace yourself for this, 16,000 words over the course of a single day. <laughs> not for you, Dave. Just for some context with that. A typical high school essay runs anywhere between 500 and 1,000 words in length. To put that number into perspective, the average person will speaks about 16 essays worth of words in a single day. I bet you didn't know you could talk so much. That is a lot of talking. And I would suspect, judging from my own life, that most of my talking and most of our talking is probably unnecessary. Of course, we do need to speak. Speaking, after all, is our primary mode of communication with others. We speak to make, our, to make known our needs, our wants, our thoughts, and our feelings. We use words to articulate what is going on in our minds, and maybe that's the reason why we talk so much. Because we have a lot going on in our minds. We have much to tell. We have much to inform. We have much to correct and much to make happen in our lives. We are so intent on speaking 
that most times we actually forget how to listen. The spiritual discipline of silence is really the discipline of saying less. Through it, we endeavor to keep silent for the purpose of training our ears to listen better, not only to the needs of others around us, but most importantly, to the voice of God in our lives. The fact that we talk too much is nothing new, though. It's been, it's been a human problem ever since the Old Testament times. In Ecclesiastes 5, verses 1 to 2, we read these words. Guard your steps as you go to the house of God and approach to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know what, that what they are doing is evil. Do not be quick with your mouth or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. When we speak more than we need to, it's an indication that our hearts are actually very inwardly focused, focused on our will and not necessarily on God's will. When we speak quickly or rashly, it is evidence that our minds are not really interested in what God has to say. We'd rather get to it first and speak what we want to say. Ecclesiastes calls this the sacrifice of fools. That is, when we think that we can make God agree to our plans. In the discipline of silence, we are intentionally, we are purposely slowing down our tongues and training our ears to learn to discern the voice of God around us. Psalm 37 verse 7 tells us, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not get upset because of the one who is successful in his way or because of the person who carries out wicked schemes. Many translations will say, be still before the Lord. It's just as well. It is a word that refers to both physical stillness and also stillness of speech. It could just as well be read, be silent before God, and instead wait patiently for him, even when it seems that the wicked are getting away with evil. This verse, I think, hits at the heart of why we talk so much and why we find it difficult to be silent. Because silence makes us feel helpless. Silence makes us feel helpless. Words are our primary mode of communication, but they are also our most powerful tool of manipulation. It is with our words that we seek to control the people around us. With our words, we seek to control the circumstances that are going on around us. It is with our words that we attempt to set others straight, to give them a piece of our mind, to argue with those that we are disagreeing with. It is with our words that we attempt to shape our public image, what other people think about us. And it is with words that we defend our actions against criticisms. If we are silent, then others might run off into the world with this idea that's untrue. Or they might make a decision that's not right in our eyes. They might end up succeeding in the wrong thing if we're not there to tell them what to do. If we're silent, then who's going to make sure that the world is in order? It's a rhetorical question. If we ever thought it was us in the first place that was supposed to set everyone straight, then we're wrong. In his book, The Celebration of Discipline, Theologian and pastor Richard Foster writes these words of wisdom. He says, Silence is one of the deepest disciplines of the Spirit, simply because it puts the stopper on all self-justification. Of the fruits of silence is the freedom to let God be our justifier. We don't need to straighten others out. 
The spiritual discipline of silence is a practice to control our tongues. And it's meant to serve as a reminder to us that it's not our job to set everyone straight. It's not our job to control everyone in every circumstance that we find ourselves in. We don't need to constantly jump in with our two cents. Silence forces us to withhold, withhold our corrective instinct. And instead, first listen for God's direction. What does God think? And when we've made it a habit to listen before we speak, it teaches our hearts to trust more deeply that God will do what's best and that we need not fret about it. Like Richard Foster says, silence is a discipline that brings freedom to us. It eases our anxious hearts. The discipline of silence is perhaps most clearly exemplified in the life of the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings 19. But first, a little bit of context might be helpful. We are introduced to the prophet Elijah in chapter 17 where he fearlessly marches straight into the courtroom of King Ahab with a message from God. Because King Ahab had led Israel into idolatry by worshiping Baal, God was going to send a drought to them. Through Elijah, God performed quite a number of miracles. Through Elijah, God started the drought. Through Elijah, he miraculously provided flour and oil for a widow who was staring into the face of death by starvation. When that same widow's son died, it was Elijah who raised him back to life. It was Elijah who called for the showdown on Mount Carmel, where Baal was proven to be false, and Israel's God was proven to be true. Elijah prayed, and God sent fire from heaven that consumed not only the sacrifice, but it even evaporated the stone altar that he had set up. Elijah was privileged to be the prophet of God. He was God's spokesman. He did a lot of talking for God during a time of unprecedented divine intervention. But then, his tone changes once we enter chapter 19. Jezebel, the wife of King Ahab, is furious about what Elijah has done. And she's threatening to kill him. After performing so many miracles on God's behalf, and after spending so much time talking to Israel, convincing them to turn back to God, Elijah did not envision this outcome. Didn't he do enough? Didn't he say enough? And now Jezebel is going to get away with this? In a state of deep depression, Elijah asks God to just take his life. He doesn't want to deal with this. And it is here that God takes Elijah into the wilderness on a much-needed retreat of silence. Listen to the words of 1 Kings 19, verses 9 to 10. Then he came there to a cave and spent the night there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of armies, for the sons of Israel have abandoned your covenant, have torn down your altars, and have killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they have sought to take my life. We'll leave it there for a moment. God directs Elijah to a cave deep in the wilderness. He's alone. He's in silence. And this is where he meets God. But can you still hear the self-centeredness in Elijah's complaint? In his own eyes, he's been more zealous than everyone else. In Elijah's eyes, while everyone else has abandoned God, he's been the one who defended the Lord. He's been the one who proved God and spoke for God. He's done everything in his power to change the mind of the people. 
and the king. Shouldn't that have worked? Instead, all of Elijah's words to the king seem to fall on deaf ears. And now he's thinking, now what? It's all over. Woe is me, the world is going to end. I find it strange that after all these experiences that he's had, that Elijah could so easily think that God is so powerless. That this is it. That Elijah's hit a roadblock, but now suddenly God's hit a roadblock too. It's as if somewhere in the course of his ministry, Elijah began to think that it all hinged upon him. It seems that the more he worked to control things, the less he left in God's care. It seems that the more he talked, the less he remembered to listen for God's direction. To that point, or to the point that he could only now hear himself. He couldn't hear God, and everything seemed hopeless. Listen to God's response in verse 11 to 13. So he, that's God, said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and powerful wind was tearing out the mountains and breaking the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle blowing. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? What is Elijah doing there? He's learning. He's learning that he needs to listen. The ESV Bible describes the gentle wind as a low whisper. The NIV translates it as a gentle whisper. Much the same thing. Either way, it is the whisper of God. This is God now talking to Elijah. God is teaching Elijah something very important, something that we need to take note of. Before the whisper, there was a powerful wind that tore apart the mountains. But we're told very specifically that God was not in that wind. There was an earthquake that rattled Elijah's teeth. But we're told specifically that God was not in the earthquake. There was a fire that probably singed Elijah's eyebrows. But again, we're told very specifically that God was not in the fire either. And then, after all this great commotion settles down, there comes a gentle blowing a low whisper, a sound that might be difficult to hear if you were not listening for it. For this, Elijah would have to lean in, cupping his hands over his ears in order to hear it. He would have to make an effort to be still and to listen closely. The question is, can Elijah be quiet long enough to hear it? Can we be quiet long enough to hear it? God's message to Elijah and also to us is simple. And that is that he's always speaking. But we are not always listening. We're not listening close enough to hear him. Sometimes God works in loud and powerful ways that are impossible to ignore. Like in miracles like in resurrections, like in fires from heaven that consume whole sacrifices and stones. But there are times when he speaks in a gentle whisper. 
And if we have not learned to quiet our minds and our tongues to listen, then we won't hear it. The discipline of silence is the commitment to speaking less in an effort to listening more. It is the practice of trying to control less and entrust more to God. It is a discipline that trains us to quiet our wills from all that is distracting us and to be more observant of where God might be at work around us. I want to offer you some practical suggestions for the discipline of silence. Spend a few hours per day, at least try to spend a few hours per day, in dedicated silence. No talking. Mornings and evenings are great for this. And in the silence, seek God through prayer. I recognize that it is not always practical, nor is it healthy to be silent for large chunks of the day. We still must communicate. We still have to do our jobs and talk to the people we love. So I would encourage you to practice some smaller habits of silence. When others are speaking to you, listen fully and listen at intently. And resist the temptation to cut in or to formulate a response until you have heard them fully. Think about what you're planning to say before you actually say it. You'll find that some things are better left unsaid after you've thought about them. Try to never speak in haste or in angry reaction. This avoids a lot of misunderstandings. Avoid criticizing others. And when criticism is necessary, speak it thoughtfully and constructively. Avoid bragging and self-praising as much as is possible. Only give advice to those who ask or to those with whom you have a relationship of trust. These are only a few suggestions, but when they are implemented, they will result in us speaking less. And hopefully over time, they will train us to listen better to what God is speaking to us. <coughs> For this sermon, I've chosen to focus mainly on the discipline of silence because it is a much neglected discipline and one that deserves more attention. But closely related to the discipline of silence is the discipline of solitude. If silence is the discipline of saying less, then solitude is the discipline of doing less. Elijah's retreat to the cave was arguably just as much about solitude as it was about silence. In 1 Kings 19, verse 8, it tells us that before God's whisper on the mountain, Elijah journeyed through the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, all by himself. There was not another soul in sight. It was a time that was meant to give him a break, a time of quiet refreshment for his soul in the presence of God, a time to reorient himself to God's purposes. In the discipline of solitude, we are intentionally taking time away, stopping our work, stopping our plans, our busyness, and our constant striving for more in order to quiet ourselves, to quiet our will, and to listen for God's direction. So here are some practical suggestions for the discipline of solitude. Allow yourself to take regular life breaks in which you get away for an evening, perhaps for a day, or even a weekend. 
and focus your time on prayer, on reading, and on intentionally seeking God. It could be an hour in the library, an afternoon on a hiking trail, or perhaps driving in your car. Contemplate the larger picture of your life. What are you doing? What are your goals? What are your expectations? And then give those to God and ask for his direction with them. Ultimately, the discipline of solitude is a time to turn off the distractions of everyday life and to spend time with your Heavenly Father. As we turn our attention now from the sermon to the Lord's Supper, we recognize that this too is a time in which we are encouraged to turn off the distractions of life, to remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us, giving his life on the cross that we might be reconciled to God. It is his gift of grace that makes our salvation possible. And in this act of remembering, we are offering our thanksgiving and our worship. It is a privilege for us to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Through this meal, we are anticipating with joy, sitting at Christ's heavenly table in the age to come, when all things are made new. We are reminding ourselves that we are his and he is ours, and that we are brothers and sisters in him, united in him. The Lord's Supper is a meal that is only meaningful for those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, who died for them. It is for those who desire his help in leading a life that is honoring to him. It is for all that confess and grieve their sin before God, truly repenting and seeking deliverance. It is for all those who strive to walk in love and in obedience to God's commands. With this in mind, before taking part, we encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to examine your heart and to reveal anything within you that might hinder your communion with him or with others. Let's spend a few moments in silent prayer before our Heavenly Father. I'll call you back here. The bread and the cup are stationed here in the front, in front of the pulpit. I invite all who profess faith in Christ to come pick up the bread and the cup. We ask that you would come forward down the inner aisle and then return to your seats along the outer aisles. Once you have made it back to your seat, please wait patiently so that we can all partake together. Before I call you forward, is there anybody who, for mobility reasons, uh, would like like to be served the bread and the cup? Thank you. We will make sure to serve you. Another thing that I would like to mention. You will notice when you come up here that the bread isn't going to look as usual. 
That is because today we are using crackers. It is not our plan to use crackers regularly, but when needed, they are a good substitute. And I want to just remind us that the significance of communion is not in the type of bread that we use. We're not worshiping the bread. The bread is a symbol of Christ's sacrifice for us. And we are here to worship him and to remember his death to atone for our sin and his purchase of our salvation. The meaning remains the same. I invite you now to come forward and receive the bread and the wine. Napkin and a. There's one, one person.
Has there, is there, have we passed anybody over? Is there anybody that did not receive a cracker or juice that would like to? Okay. I want to urge us to remember that this is the Lord's table, not our table. It is Christ's sacrifice that has allowed us here, not our own merit. So come, not because you feel that you must, but because you may. Come not to testify that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord and earnestly desire to walk with him. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim to God's grace, but because in your sin you stand in constant need of God's mercy and help. Come not to, an ex to express an opinion, but to truly commune with our Savior. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 and 24, Paul is teaching the Corinthian church about the importance of communion and celebrating what the Lord has done for us. And then he writes these words. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray, giving thanks for the crackers and the juice. Heavenly Father, as we hold this bread in our fingers and this cup in our hands, we remember your Son, Jesus, who willingly took on flesh and who gave his life as a sacrifice of love, shedding his blood in order to set us free from the bondage of sin and death. Our gratitude is beyond words. Lord, we ask that you would bless this bread and this cup, that through it you would sustain us and energize us to live lives in faithful obedience to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The bread that you hold is the symbol of Christ's body broken for you. Take and eat. Likewise, the cup that you now hold is the symbol of the new covenant through the shed blood of Christ. Take and drink. May we be people who live lives that are shaped by the good news of Jesus. May we be people who proclaim, both with our voices and with our actions, the joy of salvation that is offered through the shed blood of Christ. The Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. I will now call on Sheila and Susie to lead us in worship. Pastor Rob. Let's turn to number 340. Nearer, still nearer. 340. And you can stand with me as well.
blessing for this morning is found in Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face shine on us, so that your ways may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples in equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest, and God, our God, still blesses us. May God bless us still, so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Go in peace.